I was today years old when I learned what a dead man's hand is, and it's disturbing. During this episode of Cruise Through HTX, I'm joined by best-selling author Brad Taylor. He's always fun to talk to. His new novel is called Dead Man's Hand, and it's got a lot of connections to real-world events as it pertains to Ukraine and Russia. In fact, one of the characters in the book is Vladimir Putin. So we're going to talk about the research that went into the novel. You'll hear us talk about the risks for the book's storyline, what the dead man's hand is, and how it inspired the entire writing of the book. Brad's from the Houston area, by the way, Conroe to be exact, and he's going to be in town signing books at Murder by the Book on January 25th. The new novel, Dead Man's Hand, is going to be in stores January 23rd, so mark that on your calendar as well, and link up with Brad at bradtaylorbooks.com. If you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed putting it together for you, please hit that subscribe button and share with your family and friends. Hi, I'm Ed Sheeran. This is Bruno Mars. Hey, it's Katy Perry. This is your man Flo Rida with Freddie Cruz. This is AJ Mitchell with Freddie Cruz. Freddie Cruz. Freddie Cruz. Yeah, let's go pick Mr. 305 and you already know what it is. My name is Freddie and it's time to cruise through HTX. <laughs> your research trips sound legendary, but I've got to know about this this peace and love commune that you visited while you were in Sweden and how it went with your wife because it appeared that she had some reluctance. Did she go in the entire time you were there or was it just for a few minutes? Well, we didn't spend a whole lot. We spent maybe half a day there. Uh, That thing just made the news, by the way. They're uh, talking about booting them all now. So it's a big fight over there. It used to be an old military uh, facility. And basically what happened in the 70s, the military was no longer there and it was just in disrepair. And some, uh, you know, hippies went in there and said, we're going to make our own little country here. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger until they took over the whole base. So all the barracks, that's where people live and they're building things up and all that. They're using all that. Uh, and the, uh, the police went in there to kick them out one time. It got to be all this, you know, that's not fair. That's not fair. And so they've kind of let them just live there. They had one point in the uh, late 90s where they were doing hard drugs in there and there was a lot of violence that was going on in there. And so the police came in again and the, the commune itself said, Christiana said, we'll take care of this ourselves. And so they did. They booted out all the uh, bad drug people and the biker gangs and all that. They got rid of them. And they still sell marijuana like there's no tomorrow. There's a whole street, Hashi Street. Uh, as soon as you walk in there, the, um, there's a giant sign saying, don't take any pictures. So I was like, damn it. <laughs> we went through all there and you know and, and you get around the backside there's restaurants and pubs and bike shops and all kinds of stuff you can walk around all everywhere you want to go and it's kind of a mixture there's people that live there and they all do look like uh, kind of like stray dogs just laying on the sidewalk you can tell who lives there because they're not doing anything really productive uh and then there's you know there's people who are just fascinated by tours people like me that come in just to see what it is and you know, it's a clear night and day difference between okay that guy lives here That guy's just looking. So did you ever go up to any one of the strangers and say, hey, I'm writing a book and I need some help? No, not in in there. I mean, I've done that plenty of times, but not inside there. I didn't didn't need any of their help in there. I mean, I I could figure out what I wanted to do. I'd read all the history of it and everything. I didn't, what was I going to do? Here, let me show you my mattress on the floor. (laughs) It, you know, it sounds like a... Like a cross between Chaz Chop and maybe like a bougier version of Skid Row. Yeah, that's basically what it is. It really is. And they have their own covenant and, you know, they claim to have a city council and all this. Uh, so it functions. And it's just that, uh, you know, the cops come in once every three days and kind of disheartenedly say, you know, they got lookouts. And as soon as the cops come in, they pack up all their dope and run off. And it's just an empty street then. It's just a game they play. But I just saw something two weeks ago where they were saying, we're sick of this place. We want to get rid of them. Huh. You know, it, and it's interesting how you wrote that you you spent a, a half a day there and you wrote this little clip. Uh, it's it seems like a little clip of um, a part of the story in which the bad guys and I'm dancing around trying to not give away too much. It's early in the novel, uh, but the bad guys are like, "Well, why would they be there?" Or no, I'm sorry, the good. No, this is the good guys. So the good guys are like, "Yeah, well, that makes sense. Why are they there?" No, it's the perfect place to to go if you're trying to. Yeah, because they take in everybody. They're like, you know, you you know, they hate the man. You hate the man. Come on in. We hate the man too, <laughs> and they'll protect you. So, yeah. Um, one of the other interesting things about the novel is that you have Putin as a character, 
And how many videos did you have to watch of Putin or you kind of got a, a good idea of just being in the world that you that you come from? You, you're like, yeah, well, you know, not much more research to do. Yeah, I've studied him for a long time. I, he's uh, actually I've used him in another book too, Ghosts of War, which was, uh, I don't know, five books ago. Um, I, I fully expected my publisher to say, you know, change his name to Uden or, you know, something like that. They didn't. I was like, OK, leave it in. This is my fourth Brad Taylor book that I've read. And the thing that I've noticed about you and the only other author uh, that can do this so flawlessly is Jack Carr. So the two of you in your own leagues where you can write something that's four or 500 pages in excess, and it seems like a short story. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so what, what, is, what is the secret to to what's the secret to the sauce? Is it just putting the reps in, getting under the bar that, you know, we're close to 20 times. You got a series of, you got short stories. How do you, how do you pull that off? I don't know. I mean, I've never had any instruction in writing. I, uh, I basically, when I first started writing, I just said, I'm going to write something that I'd like to read. And that's what I did. I couldn't say what the secret sauce is. That's like, I guess, asking Michael Jordan, what's the secret sauce for sinking baskets? I mean, if there was a secret sauce, then everybody would sink, be sinking baskets. There wouldn't be Michael Jordan. I wanted to talk about Dead Man's Hand, the title itself, being related to a very pivotal point in the book. And uh, seeing as how you come from uh, that world, studying the enemy and whatnot, and um, how close to reality is something like this uh, when somebody reads and maybe they're not looking at the headlines as much as, as much as you are uh, privy to this information. Yeah, I actually, that, uh, is what, uh, um, gave me the idea for the book. I was, when Russia invaded Ukraine, I had no intention about writing about the Ukrainian Russian war, mainly because it's current. And I, I don't like writing about current events. I like to be right on the cutting edge because if you write about current events. The problem is it's current. I mean, it could, it could fall apart. And uh, I uh, uh, was looking at the war, studying everything that's going on. One of the things is, of course, that, you know, this could escalate into a nuclear war. And so I'd done a lot of uh, research. My master's thesis was actually on counter leadership targeting and conflict termination. So I knew a little bit about some of the PDs, presidential directives that we'd had in the past. And the, uh, what I didn't know about, which I read about, was a system called uh, perimeters, what the USSR, the Soviet Union, called it the perimeter system. And it came out of... Uh, um, Reagan created uh, the SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, which is the Star Wars system, which would theoretically knock out any missile that came in. It was a space-based laser thing that anybody shot a missile at us, we could knock it out of the air. Uh, of course, it never came anywhere near that <laughs> to fruition, but that's what we were bragging about. And it scared the Soviet Union they, so, because right then we had uh, mutually assured destruction. MAD was, even if you hit me, I'm still going to hit you and, you know, we're going to destroy each other. And that theoretically kept us from going to nuclear war. Well, if we had the ability to knock out every one of their missiles, then in their mindset, that increased our ability to do a first strike because there's no threat. MAD no longer exists. We do a first strike, then uh, we win and you can't hit us. Um, so they came up, they couldn't compete with SDI. They came up with a perimeter system, which uh, in the West, in NATO, was called the dead hand. Uh, and it basically was the very first stepping in of artificial intelligence. So they had this system that would test seismic activity. It would test communication nodes. It would test all these different things. And if all the conditions were met, meaning they had just assumed the first strike, that earth shook and nobody was talking to everybody and everything's down, then the perimeter system went to alert. And the perimeter system had the ability to launch every nuclear missile that was still alive in Russia. And any second lieutenant out there in the tundra could just hit a button and they'd all go launching, which is why it was called the dead hand. You hit kill us all. We're still launching the missiles. And I read that and I was like, and it still exists. It's still in Russia. They still have it. And I thought, man, that is that's a story there. And so that's when I started really looking at Ukraine, saying that's a really good story. So the fictional part of the book is that Putin has changed the dead hand and calls now calls it the dead man's hand. So instead of a first strike, which is what the perimeter system is designed to uh, retaliate against, he changed it to, if I get killed, if I'm the one that dies, launch the missiles. And that was the genesis of the book. If I can't have absolute power, none of you can. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is something he's kind of done all along anyway. So he's always killing people left and right in the real world. You know, the 
and anybody wants to. Uh, I mean, when I wrote the book, because I was saying, like I said earlier, it's about current events, uh, and current events are a problem because they're current. And I wrote my publisher when I sent him the framework. I said, look, there's three risks for this book. First risk is that the Ukraine war is ended. Either Ukraine wins or Russia wins or it's settled before this book comes out. I said, I don't see that. I've been studying for a while. It's a low risk, but it is a risk. Uh, obviously, that hasn't happened. Uh, risk number two was that uh, Sweden would join NATO. Part of the book is uh, a function of the book is Sweden's trying to join NATO and uh, Putin's trying to thwart that. And I said, odds are Sweden will probably be in NATO by the time this book comes out. Uh, they're very close. They still have not joined NATO, <laughs> but they're very, very close. Turkey's still holding out. They have sent it to the parliament. So I expect that to happen February or March or something like that. Uh, the third risk, though, I said it's a risk, but it's not going to happen is somebody gets rid of Putin. If somebody gets rid of Putin, then they, obviously the whole book is you know worthless. But that'll never happen. And then Wagner crossed the border. Prigozhin, you know, in his band of merry mercenaries, crossed the border. I was like, you know, two chapters from finishing the book, and uh, he's running up to Moscow. He's going to take out Putin. I'm like, what in the world? What are you doing? Yeah, that's wild. And I wanted to ask you about Turkey as well, man, because um, it's interesting that they kind of have this love-hate relationship. At least it seems to a novice like me, they have a love-hate relationship with NATO. It's like, well, we're a part of your gang, but we really don't like any of you Westerners. Um, so you've got the deal where um, they're buying Russian arms. And in in so... I wanted to kind of I want to bring this back to the real world um, and ask you what your thoughts are on Turkey and their dealings with Russia. And is it good to kind of have that sort of frenemy in NATO? They certainly cause a lot of problems. Um, they the issue is, I mean, people say we should just kick them out of NATO. Well, if you kick them out of NATO, they're, they're obviously going to turn into a super enemy. Uh, right now, they and they do provide a lot of benefits. There's a lot of uh, negotiating stuff they do for us around the world. There's all kinds of things that uh, uh, Turkey can do that we can't, but they are a giant thorn in the side. So they bought the S-400 uh, anti-aircraft system, missile system from Russia, which uh, the problem with that is they also wanted our F-35s, the fifth generation joint strike fighter. And we're like, no, we're not giving you the F-35 if you've got S-400s because the S-400s will paint the F-35, determine what its vulnerabilities are and send it to Russia. Uh, if you buy the uh, those missile systems, we're not giving you F-35s. And they bought them and we didn't give them. We canceled the F-35 system for Turkey. Now the holdup is they want uh, Block 5 upgrades for the F-16s. Well, they're doing all that fighting in Syria against the Kurds or fighting against our allies in Kurdistan. They just bombed Iraq, if you want to be real world right now. Just last week, they blew up a bunch of Kurds in Iraq that are our allies fighting Islamic State, which uh, they call them a terrorist organization. We'd say they're, they're we recognize a terrorist organization that's inside Turkey. It's a Kurdish resistance organization, but that's not the people we're with. They, of course, claim it doesn't matter. Kurds are Kurd. I'm blowing up Kurds. Um, and so that's another sticking point. We said, we're not giving you the, the upgrades to your F-16s because of all the stuff you're doing. Well, they then turn around and say, well, I'm not letting Sweden get into NATO. Uh, the other problem they have with NATO is NATO's got, or not, uh, Sweden uh, has a lot of problems with a bunch of guys tried to do a coup inside Turkey a couple of years ago. It was kind of a big deal at the time. And he, uh, Erdogan crushed the coup. They all fled. Well, a bunch of them went to Turkey. I mean, to uh, Sweden. They're living in Sweden. And uh, the Turkeys are saying, if you Swedes, if you want to come in, you got to give us those bad guys that are in, that are living in your country. We think they're terrorists. You got to give them to us. Of course, they're living under uh, uh, Swedish laws, and the Swedes are like, I'm not just turning somebody over to you because you say so. I'm not doing that. And so that's been uh, kind of the sticking point. It's been all this friction going on. But just recently, Erdogan sent it to the parliament and said, yeah, yeah, go ahead and vote on this. They haven't voted yet, but all indications, unless something else goes wrong, uh, they're going to vote for, for ascension into NATO. The other thing that happened in Sweden, they've always got these nutcases that uh, I'm convinced are working for Putin. There's a lot of evidence they are. They went in front of the uh, uh, Turkish embassy and burned a Quran. You know, that obviously gets everybody all fired up. So the uh, when they did that, the Turks immediately said, you know, screw you, you're not going to NATO. Well, they were doing this joint thing. We're only going as a block. It's Finland and Sweden, Finland and Sweden. Eventually, um, we convinced them, hey, how about break this off and just do Finland first? 
and they've done that. And Sweden's still trying to get in. Is there a chance that so if Erdogan lets the vote go through it, or he has, and it's almost it's pretty much a done deal? Is there a chance that if somebody pisses off Erdogan, that he's like, you know what? Screw you guys. I'm out of NATO. I don't, and I'm asking this because I have no idea how any of this stuff works. No, he would never leave NATO. He gets a ton of out of NATO. I mean, if he first of all, his entire military is. Uh, that's why we were so mad about him buying the Russian systems. His entire military is all NATO equipment. Mm. If he left NATO, we'd say, okay, no more servicing for your stuff. See you later. Good luck rebuilding every bit from the, fun, the smallest weapon up to the highest airplane starting over. He, he's not going to leave NATO on his own. They're vulnerable. Yeah, well, it's just it'd be too hard to do. I mean, he'd be uh, a ship adrift without any rudder now because it— you know, Russia is not going to just immediately say they're not, they, the Warsaw Pact doesn't exist anymore. When we did NATO, they did the Warsaw Pact. It's just now Russia. What? So he's going to say, okay, I'm friends with Russia? Okay, <laughs> what's that going to get me? Not a whole lot. Everybody hates Russia. I feel like I read a, a part of this in the book where uh, there's the propaganda being spewed, and I imagine this is also in real life as well, that Russia's like, oh, yeah, the war's going great. But in, but in the meantime, it's actually not going great. The bodies are stacking and eventually the populace yeah. starts to, you know, when the bodies are coming home and they're not alive, then people are realizing, well, you know what, maybe the war is not going so good. Um, how, and so all of that being said, how much of a threat is Russia? Is it simply because they've still got nukes and not so much the boots on the ground? Well, they've got the boots on the ground. They, the, the only way they're going to win in Ukraine and they could definitely win in Ukraine is uh is mass mass is a is a is an element all its own so if i've got 10 guys who are the finest fighters in the world and you've got 10,000 guys who are mediocre you're still going to win and he's got a ton of people but that was the reason that he used uh wagner and other uh private military companies to fight in ukraine so it's precisely so he didn't have to say uh you know your sons and daughters are coming home these guys all paid to go there so he's got wagner in there fighting all over the place and then Wagner got mad because they weren't getting supported. They thought that they were being short shrift, that um, the military elements that were in there were not doing their own fighting. The military elements in there were getting all the ammunition, that Wagner guys were the ones being pushed to the front. Wagner guys are the ones that were dying. And uh, Prigozhin got too big for his britches and said, everybody loves me and I'm a, you know, I'm a kingmaker. And he decided to go try this coup over against, he said it wasn't against Putin. Uh, and I said in a Facebook video, which ended up being accurate, even though I got lambasted by people from South Africa and Australia and Italy, everybody saying I was stupid. I said, as soon as that happened, he's a dead man walking. It's no, he has no other option. Putin's going to kill him. Uh, then, of course, he let him go to Belarus and they were forming up this this base in Belarus and all this. And everybody's like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. He's Putin still loves him. Well, you know, a month ago, he's in an airplane that blew up. So Putin finally got him. But uh, the. Uh, that was the reason they'd started was they said they weren't getting the support. So Putin's doing a lot to keep the, to quell down. First of all, it's, a, it is still a propaganda state. You, it's impossible to get real news over there. Everything that's put out over the airways is we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. And the only people who know that that's not true are the people who lose their kids. Um, and so he has not done a, a full mobilization. He has not done another draft. He does not want to rock the boat on that, but he still has, you know, 10 to one, the population that Ukraine has. And it, it, that matters. This was real life, what we were just talking about. But Brad Taylor flawlessly, y'all, flawlessly intertwines current events with fiction. And his new book is called Dead Man's Hand. Uh, Putin is a character, and that's okay. He's a bad guy, and uh, I love this book, Brad. Again, uh, you, make a, you make a tome seem like a five-page college essay because it's that much fun. It's so action-packed. So uh, it's on sale January 23rd, and because Brad is from the greater Houston area, Conroe, he's going to be at Murder by the Book on Thursday, January 25th. So if you're listening to this episode right away, please go to the greatest bookstore in the history of the Lone Star State, if not these United States. Go to Murder by the Book and meet Brad. Grab your signed copy of dead man's hand for that one day they'll be selling the best book in the best bookstore 
in the nation. Exactly. Uh, Brad, I want to ask you one non-book related question before we wrap up the interview. How long does it take you, Brad Taylor, to survive in a zombie apocalypse without any guns or knives? That would depend on where the apocalypse was. If it was in the uh, um, in an urban area, I'd probably be gone pretty quick, just like everybody else, because they'd be everywhere. But if I were out in the desert, I could probably make it, or in the high mountains. BradTaylorBooks.com, by the way, is the website. You can go and get all the info on the signing at Murder by the Book as well. Thank you so much for coming by the show today, sir. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. And if they want to go to the website at BradTaylorBooks.com, there's also excerpts of all the books. They can get a flavor for how I write and things like that. (laughs) 